Hello and welcome to Roadmap 2019. I am Ladi Akiri Doluale. On this program, we interact with some of the major players in Nigeria's journey to the 2019 polls. Thanks for joining us. On today's edition of the program, my guest says his geopolitical zone in Nigeria will need some evidence of good faith if it is really to believe that it could benefit from the zoning arrangements for Nigeria's top office. My guest also says his development agenda in his state, especially in terms of infrastructure, is based on his ambition of making manufacturing hubs viable in that region. Now, please join us as we talk to the governor of Nigeria's southeast state of Abia, Dr. Okezie Ipeazu. Your Excellency, thank you for your time. Welcome to Roadmap 2019. Welcome, thank you. Now, uh, the political terrain is becoming more and more interesting. There are movements this way, there are movements this way. Um, but let me start off on a general note. Three years on, plus, in Abia State, how have you found governance in that state? Oh, well, thank you. I, I think it fits into the model people describe everywhere. You know, challenges, ups and downs. And that, to me, is what makes it exciting. Um, I thank God that um, we started with um, a plan, an agenda. And um, this agenda, um, uh, to our mind, dovetailed from our circumstance, our environment, our geography, our people. You know, because our greatest strength lies in the people of Abia State. So we started by asking ourselves, what are those things we can do better than others? And how, where, what's our location geographically uh, relative to the, the rest of the states in the region? Right. Then, and the Nigeria. And then economically, what is it we can do? What's that puts you at an advantage. Yes. And then that gave us our roadmap. And we developed a five-point agenda, which we've been trying to fix. And we also crafted a neblas to drive the five-point agenda. Now, uh, one thing that uh, Abia State is known for is that it has a manufacturing hub in uh, Aba. Yes. And you seem to have focused a bit of attention on that. Exactly. Uh, in terms of industrial development and so on. But you're facing challenges, I'm sure. Yes, yeah, sure, certainly. What are those and how are you going, how are you setting about tackling that? Well, um, if if I go straight to the challenges, uh, well, that. you can start with how what has happened okay. so far, okay. and then before you now move on to the challenges. Oh well, but in the, when you want to develop SMEs, when you want to encourage them, there are four classical challenges. One will be funding, the other one will be power, the other one will be market share. How do you expose them to? The markets, bigger markets. And, and then automation. Okay. You know, so um, of all of this, we knew that we could not do anything about power immediately. Um, but we, 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 we understood our potentials. One, we have an IPP, uh, geometric Metric, power, yeah. which has been uh, in the pipeline. But thank God today that uh, we are beginning to see the silver lining at the end of the day. Um, but that wasn't our remit because it's completely in the hands of the private sector and federal government to deal with. But we, we, we went for aggressive marketing because at least that particular variable we could control. And then I started from my inaugural speech to proclaim that I was going to add on only made in ABBA things. You know, um, ABBA for me was an existing brand, uh, but an existing brand that was to serve uh, as a metaphor for the entire Nigerian youth and our capacity and capability to produce things and do things with our hands. So when I say made in Abba, patronized made in Abba, I'm saying patronized made in Nigeria, you know, because I, it doesn't matter to me where it is manufactured, but the important thing is for us as leaders to begin to um, appreciate the hard work of our boys. Uh, if it is not uh, looking like uh, the products from Gucci, Louis Vuitton and all that, that doesn't detract from the fact that somebody is creating something. And then if we continue to encourage that person, that... It will eventually get, get to... Exactly. Or to even those. get better. You know, as I would uh, prove to you later. So, 
we started this aggressive made in our marketing. And by marketing made in our aggressively, we have got to the point where we did a fashion show in Abuja and it attracted 50 uh, members of the diplomatic community coming to see West what is. Exactly. We felt encouraged. And we did another one in New York. And people were asking, ah, ah we've not done it in Abuja, we are doing it in Abuja. I said, well, if you have a, a light, you go and place it on a mountain top, not under the bushel. So for me in Nigeria, Abuja was to make the statement that I needed the attention of the diplomatic community. Because um, our Nigerian mentality uh, has something to do with um, waiting for others to appreciate us before we... We then appreciate them. ourselves. Yes, exactly. And I, I didn't want to fight that. So I decided to go with the tide. And it has yielded great results because today, as we speak, the Rural Electrification Agency, you know, um, driven by the federal government, uh, is partnering with the private sector person to give area area. Um, some, Which is another. Exactly. Another challenge. You know, so that's, we have solved the second challenge because 34 shops, 34,000 shops out of a total of about 120,000 uh, have had power for the past eight months uninterrupted. And on a pilot basis, and we are sure that they are going to scale up and all that. And then Geometrics also has come on board because we got an investor for our new Enyimbe Economic City, which is uh, the most audacious uh, project of this administration. And then um, the investor came, he's coming with 20 billion US dollars for a textile factory, and he needs to ensure that power is stable. So the man is investing in geometrics, and we are sure that before the end of the year, good and glorious news will come. So power for me um, is no longer an issue. an issue because I can put a terminal there to eat sometime. And then um, automation. You recall we sent 30 out of a band of 100 shoemakers, yes. raw talents, shoemakers, uh, because we were encouraged. In China, they don't speak English language. But they are very skilled in what they do, and they master it properly. So we said, well, um, degree qualification is not relevant in what... In this particular design. aspect. So let the raw shoemakers join me to China, and I exposed them to a shoe factory that was introduced to us by an equipment manufacturer. So the equipment manufacturer introduced us to that shoe factory because the shoe factory uses his equipment and... That is the equipment we that you to also exactly. try to use. So, uh, you know, those 30 boys have gone and come back. And the outcome is beautiful. I'll, I'll give you an example. Two out of those 30 got to the point that the Chinese that were working on some of the machines they tried their hands on had to be laid off. They, they now engaged those two on part time basis. You know, and then um, it gave me indication that. These boys can, can really do well if we provide the environment and circumstances. And today we have ordered the equipment, and then we are, they are doing train the trainer program for other shoemakers in, in that cluster. So before December, we are sure that the first automated shoe line, uh, fully owned by those shoemakers themselves. Yes, not government, not, government, and government not no, any no, foreign. No. no. So all we are going to do is to consult as service to ensure that the bookkeeping is proper. We'll still help them, support them with marketing. We have orders from um, Nigerian Army. We have orders from, from Navy. We have orders from police. We are even going to, to Mali, I think, sometime before the end of the year to give a talk. Because the Malian military also wants said, ah, if Nigerian military can wear... Then why can't we can also can't wear. You know, So that is the kind of... Ripple effect that we plan to elicit and it's coming to happen. There's a link between that and general infrastructure. Yes. Because one of the other things that the research shows that you also focused on is roads. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I read, I read, and of course I actually saw you where you talked uh, about 56 roads. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's, there are too many mm -hmm. to mention here, mm -hmm. but. Is there a nexus between that and what you have just told us about the, the manufacturing ex ex Exactly. Because um, immediately we defined our vision and our plan. So it took away so many things that were happening in the past. One of them is no, no, nobody can talk about coming to do roads to lead into my house. You know, because all of that will not fall into our economic agenda. 
So we focused on two, two priority roads, roads that lead to our clusters, economic nodes, or roads that lead to and out of Aba, or Omai, as the case may be. So uh, we had Fox Road, you know, for more than 16 years, nobody had traveled from one end of Fox Road to the other. You, it's, it's not possible. In fact, at some point, you need to stop, and somebody will back you, of and then you will resume. You know. But today, we started by laying underground pipes six and a half kilometers to the river. Within the first hundred days, we started dredging the river, knowing that we're going to pipe all water, stop water to the river. Many people didn't understand what we're dredging. That is why today, I'm happy to say as I speak that Abia is no longer on the list of flood-prone states. Yes, I did, was looking out for it, exactly. actually, when the last warning no, no, was no, no, issued, no. it was we not. Did, we did massive desilting. We did massive, and today is policy that you can't do road in Abia without drainage, end to end. You know, and you remember we, we pioneered cement uh, pavement technology in road making because for areas where we see that water has sat on the road for uh, more than five years, uh, the texture of that particular area, soil texture has gone bad, silty, so you, you can no longer do the common asphalt treatment. So for such roads, if we want to recover them, we do nine inch uh, concrete with BROC in between and then asphalt plus the drainage and, and, and tie the road to the drainage. Okay. So that at least, and I, this speaks to our investors, because when I want to market Abia, I speak to the quality of infrastructure. So that the investor will know that if it takes him five years to incubate his business and, and get it running, that the infrastructure we are put in place it will still, be, will still there. be there, exactly. That is what many people don't understand. If an investor is coming with one billion, he, he wants to see infrastructure that can uh, be there while his business incubates and then, you know, starts running. So um, today we have opened up access to all our economic nodes, all. And we have created two alternative routes leading to Akwa, leading to Aba from Akwa Ibom. From any part of Aba today, city center in Aba, if you want to go to Akwa Ibom in 25 minutes, I'm in Akwa Ibom. And if I can create that flux, trade and commerce, which is one of our pillars, won't, won't flourish. Won't, won't flourish. And then the small scale manufacturing which our people are known for won't also flourish because they need to evacuate the what they've produced exactly. to, to where you those know, who purchase. You know. will so work. yes, that is why we regard road infrastructure, we regard health, we regard education as an enabler to drive the pillars of development and uh, it's been working for us so far.